Anybody else? Does anybody have a comment, a question? We just kind of started talking tonight and went for it. I hope we're doing okay. John? I think one aspect of this is uh, enduring faith. I think Bill Johnson teaches on it from experience. Um, He lost a secretary and a father to cancer. And that was a few years back. And now they have between 80 and 90 percent success rate praying against cancers. People fly in from all over the world in the Bethel. They they have about 30 different ministers. they got a street ministry that I believe is second to none out there. It's just amazing. But they're aggressive. They're going after the gospel of the kingdom. And signs and wonders and miracles are following them. They're not chasing them. They're following them because they're believers. And they didn't retreat. They didn't try to figure out why they lost the battle or two, important battles. But both of those people are with the Lord. They're walking on streets of gold right now. We don't always understand why we don't win every battle. But we read the book. We know we win the war. And if we don't turn tail and run, we keep going after it, we're going to have more and more victories. The phrase I'm hearing is don't draw conclusions. If you stay on the Word and let the Word keep teaching and grow up in Him, don't draw conclusions and define something for the way it seems. That's what we tend to do all the time. Does that make sense? And then we won't endure. Go ahead. Yeah. One other thing, this isn't to backtrack a whole lot, but it's something that we've discussed before, and it actually gets back to the third chapter of Genesis. When Dan was talking about uh, pills and bringing them along, he came into agreement with the adversary. With he the came into agreement with the natural knowledge of man. Yes. And if you go back to the third chapter of Genesis, when Eve listened to the other voice and yeah. came into agreement with it, she empowered Satan and ultimately her husband followed her. Satan had duplicated himself and they lost the authority. They lost the keys. Jesus got them back. But we as man lost the authority at that point. And we have to be very careful what we come into agreement with right. ever since. Because what we agree with, we empower. It's just very, this teaching very of, of faith is, is so critical. Like, like what Bob's question, it, it wasn't that it was an off-the-wall question because it's, a, it's actually a very common question when people teach faith because I've heard faith taught that, well, if you're really in faith, you'll do this, you'll do that, you'll do this, you'll do that. And I just don't agree. I don't teach faith that way. I believe we grow up into him. We grow up into faith. And then that knowing, what was said earlier, that knowing will rise in your heart and you'll actually hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying or you'll get that impression to do something. But I've watched people with good hearts and good intention try to do not, not the exact thing that Bob said about going out and getting in his car and just driving, but certain things to defy their situation, to call it faith. But it was more a response of a method that was preached to them or something they ought to do if they were in faith. They'd do this. And it was just powerless. And they did it and did it and did it. You know what I'm saying? They it, it, it just did it and did it and did it, trying to lay a hold of faith and doing that. And... uh you know, and you can all, you always, then you hear testimonies of people that say, yeah, but I did that. God just showed up and moved, etc. But I believe it has to come out of a sense of knowing. Faith is the realization, the substance, the tangibility of your hope. So it's acting on the word of God that affirms your hope. Who knows everybody hopes to get better? Okay, but the word of God, here's another good thought. Faith works through love. And God so loved the world, he gave his son, he gave his word, and made him manifest. So we have the word of God manifested even to us now through the life of Jesus because of God's love. So God's love gave us the word, and faith comes, works through love, but it comes by hearing and hearing by the word. So faith doesn't even come from another person's experience. Faith doesn't come from a miracle. Hope does. Encouragement does. So if I, if I see Nan back there and she has a testimony and I have a similar situation and she's showing this testimony, all of a sudden hope rises in my heart and I say, whoa, man, God did it for her. God could do it for me. And all of a sudden the word starts connecting and then faith rises through what the word says. But the fact that God did a miracle, say somebody just got up and got healed, that gives people hope that God does this stuff and moves this way. But the miracle itself doesn't release faith. 
in, the, in another person's heart. Because faith comes by the word. You have to see it in a personal way. You have to see it for you. Does that make sense? Well, what about the testimony of Jesus as the spirit of prophecy? That's, it's, well, what's the spirit of prophecy? So think about that. The t- well, the testimony of Jesus, you can, what's that? That's the God revealed. That's the life of, that's not just the acts of Jesus or the doings of Jesus. The testimony of Jesus, that's the end right there. The testimony of Jesus is God revealed, crucified, raised from the dead. That, the testimony of Jesus alone is my healing because righteous judgment comes through his testimony. I'm not talking about the testimony of Jesus, spirit of prophecy, when I'm talking about this. I'm talking about the fact that, say she was in a wheelchair and a paralytic, and all of a sudden we know she's not anymore. That doesn't just instantly release faith into the heart of a person. It, it turns somebody Godward and gets them to embrace a word for themselves in that situation because they see what God did for them. It doesn't just automatically release faith. It's not an automatic place of faith, a miracle. Jesus worked all these miracles among them and they still did not believe him. Capernaum, there was no city that had more things done than Capernaum. And yet they didn't repent. They didn't change the way they thought. They weren't changed. It's amazing. God did more miracles in there. He said if Sodom, if Gomorrah, if Tyre, and Sidon, if, if the things that I did in your town would have been done there, Sodom and Gomorrah would still be here. Oh, my gosh. So, you know, it's just amazing. Uh, but faith comes by hearing. That's what we know scripturally. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. How's the word come alive in somebody when they see the word through the love of God? Or it's just a letter. It's just a book. It's just, it's just a method. It's just, I've seen so many people frustrated with faith and frustrated with believing God and frustrated with their prayer life because they're doing it in a mechanical, if I do this, 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 and this, God will do this, 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 and this. And it's impersonal. It's receiving no grace. There's no love, no growing in God. There's just disheartened, mad, well, I tried that and God didn't move for me. I said, somebody tell me that again this week. Well, I did all that. I've done all that. It didn't work for me. Right out of their mouth. Because they were taught faith that way. If you just say this and say this and keep on confessing this and keep on confessing this, God will move. There's thousands and thousands of people out there that have gone that road. And they feel very come up empty. They have no sense of the love of God. And they're actually now mad at the very God they were crying out and discouraged with, quote, the gospel. I've met thousands, or uh, I've met uh, lots of people, which reveals to me there's thousands of people. Because just in my life I've met, I talk to people. They say, well, I tried that. Well, I've been there. I did that. I, oh, I prayed that. I prayed that for three weeks, nonstop, every day, probably ten times a day. God never answered. And I'm thinking, see, here's the difference. You say, well, what are we supposed to Take what you pray and believe in it. Turn and look to God personally and just talk to him and just let him be a father. God, I thank you. You understand what I'm going through right now. And I see the price you paid through your son. I appreciate that you love me. I thank you that every strike you took, Jesus, on your back is because you saw deliverance from me. You wanted to set me free. You're such a just judge. You're amazing. That sure beats by his stripes I'm healed, by his stripes I'm healed, by his stripes I'm healed. Get personal. Get intimate. It's a whole lot more than words. It's relationship. It's just relationship. And I understand there's principles of confession and principles there. But if, if they're not coming out through the sense of relationship, if they're coming out mechanically, it's, it's so such a thin line slipping into works. You're not ever healed because of what you did. You're healed because of what he did. And you stepped into a place of believing that. And what you did might have led you to believing that, but it's what you did never healed you. What you did isn't what brought healing. What he did brings healing. Man, get that clear and straight in your heart. I even tell people when they're praying for the sick, it's, it's not about what you pray. It's what you believe when you pray. Right? When you pray, believe. Believing those things that they say, because it's more than words. It's not what you pray that's so important. We put so much focus on what we're doing when we're praying for the sick sometimes that we forget to believe what he's done and put all our emphasis there. 
<laughs> that's the emphasis. That Jesus was so aware of that, that's why he didn't pray. He just said, stretch forth your hand. Because he already saw it. Get your bed and walk. Right? So it's nothing he had to produce. It was something that would command, or whatever you want to call it. It's powerful. It's authority. So, and these are just, to me, they're simple things, but they lead down a rough road if we don't understand them. I've seen a lot of good people, God-fearing people, misunderstanding these things and frustrated and give up and get tired and backslidden. I know a lot of people right now. I, I just was sitting the other day saying, God, my heart was breaking. And not in a negative way. It, it's, it's a compassionate thing. There was a whole handful of people that were running through my heart since I've been saved that I know, that I've known that had walked with the Lord that aren't even walking with the Lord, aren't even pursuing the things of God. Served in the church I was at, stuff like that, and came regularly, not even serving the Lord. It just gets me mad. It's like, Dah. see, because something has to go wrong in here. You, you, you grab a wrong precept, a wrong mindset, you grab a wrong belief, and it disheartens, and it discourages, and it wearies, and it wears on your heart, and all of a sudden you have the capacity to just say, whatever, man. Heaven for me, see, I just burr. <laughs> no way. <laughs> you know? Just further endurance there. Um, Rollin and Heidi Baker had been missionaries for about 18 years. And in 18 years, they developed four fledgling churches. Two were barely surviving, and two were mediocre at best. And she was dying of double pneumonia and a blood disorder. And in 1997, she went up to Toronto. She was so ill, she was lying prostrate under the back chairs, worshiping Jesus. She was planning on just taking a retail job if she was healthy enough to do that, because she wasn't healthy enough to stay on the mission field. And a lady got a word of knowledge. Heidi Baker was healed by a word of knowledge from the Lord, and she was now healed. She's at the back, and she's thankful. She's worshiping Jesus. Randy Clark's up front. He starts talking about his message. She just gets up in the middle of his message and starts walking down the center aisle. He sees Holy Ghost all over, and he starts prophesying. He doesn't know her from Eve. And he says, the Lord wants to know, do you want the nation of Mozambique? And she falls to her knees. She raises her hands, and she says, yes, Lord. He says, you will see the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, and the dead raised. And for the next year, she got the snot kicked out of her, and so did her husband. She got beat up physically, thrown in jail. Her husband was on his deathbed in the hospital. Guess what? He's alive and well, has a 200-plus IQ. His heart's bigger than his head. And she's the most loving person I've ever met in my whole life. Well, maybe tied with Dan and Todd. But let me tell you, no, she's this is now 10 she's years good. later, not four fledgling churches, but 8,000 churches, almost 100 people bodily raised from the dead in their ministry. Wow. And she didn't see one blind eye open her first year. She prayed for everyone she came across. And now she sees bunches of those, but it's virtually every deaf ear on the continent of Africa. They have 100% anointing. She goes out there with these throwaway orphans. She picks up in the dump, literally. They go out with 8- to 12-year-olds, and they go into Muslim villages. She says, bring me the deaf. Bring me the lame. Bring me the blind. And she always starts with the deaf, because they always, their ears always open. And the entire village is converted. It's, yeah. That's the power of the gospel of the kingdom. But it's through perseverance. Perseverance. You're never going to get there. Watch what the human mind does in most cases. God, that couldn't have been you. If that was you, then why this? And how come this? And that was six months ago, and we still haven't even seen a blind eye. And da 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 da. And the mind is the worst detriment. And all of a sudden, you got this negative confession, and oh, everything you're saying is making sense to your mind. But it's at the cost of the call. It's at the cost of the perseverance. It's at the cost of just pressing through and paying whatever price. In other words, God, you said. So I'm going to continue. God, I believe that was you. And God, I just and you just keep on going. Here's what we do. We draw conclusions back up and make a rational analogy. And it costs us every time we do that. 
I've seen, I don't know how many people do that over the years. You hear how many testimonies of awesome things God's doing. If you look at the roots of it, it was paying the price, blood, sweat, and tears kind of thing. And, and get through. David Hogan's the same way. He said in the early 70s, he said he'd go to a village, get one person get saved. He'd go back to encourage them, they'd beat him up. He'd, he'd pray for somebody sick and they'd die. He said they didn't see nothing for a couple of years. He said, here's what he said in this one video. And he said, if I believed like you all believe, I'd have said I missed God and I'd have left the mission field, wouldn't I? Because when stuff's like that, you say, well, you must be out of the will of God or not. Things wouldn't be going that bad. You'd find some protection. You'd find some this. You must have missed God. No, it's adversity. We're in spiritual war. When you declare your city as a cancer-free zone and lose your dad and secretary and student after making, it's my understanding it was after they made the declaration and went after this. These people died of cancer. That tells you there's a war. When you... When you declare a cancer-free city and start praying and interceding for cancer-free city and you lose your own dad to cancer, a secretary, and a student, that tells you it's a war. Now, that's pretty in-your-face war right there. So then you have to determine what you love. You love your own life and you love the God-given inheritance of your life more than you love fulfilling the will of God or do you love not your own life unto death? Submit them to the glory and presence of the Lord for eternity and know you can't lose in the long run and go after what you decreed because it's a war. And if you go after it, you'll win. Now they're seeing all these people here. I love stories like that. Because what it tells us is, it's not time to stop and draw conclusions. It's time to press on with the word of the Lord until we see it come to pass. It's a no-nonsense mentality. It's, that's not back off. It's good. Todd's been walking in the gospel of the kingdom for about three and a half years now. Probably four. Well, say yeah. four. And he saw his very first blind eye open in the last week and a half. But it was quite a testimony. It's so funny how that stuff works, too, because we were talking, and I, and I was telling him how, and then it's hunger and it's perseverance. We were driving in the car from, a, from wherever we were going, or we were heading to Reading that one night right before he left, and, and he was talking about blind eyes, and I said, I know. I said, I don't understand. I said, I've only ever seen two open uh, in, in my whole Christian life. I've prayed for several. I've said it, I've prayed for people with blind eyes, but I've only ever seen two open. And, and I was saying that in a very humble heart cry, like, man, I've seen two. Why not 22? You know what I mean? I've seen two. Why didn't the rest of them open? I was like crying out like, oh, I need more open. And when I said I only saw two, Todd very humbly said, well, yeah, dude, that's two more than I ever saw. He <laughs> said, I, t- I take two. And uh, I said, well, amen. I said, but the thing is, we, we know it's right. We're going to keep praying for the blind. I'm just saying, I saw two. You think, you, you know. You have the keys, you teach the stuff, you'd see more, but it didn't necessarily work that way, but I know it's there, I know it's available because I saw two. He said, dude, just lay hands on me because I need to see a blind eye open. He was just holding that conversation. And, but he's hungry, he wants that, so when he heard this person's blind, he's not even hesitating to pray. That's pray. He prayed, the second time he prayed, he said, she got her sight back. This is beautiful. Yeah, her whole life. She was 55. From age 13 to 55, she was blind from injury. Injury, 13 to 55, opened her eye and she could see, count his fingers and everything. That's fun. That's like, come on, God. Let's let the gospel explode in our hearts. Amen? So see, when you, when you taste something like that, as much of this that goes on in the church, no, and all, you know, we got to be very careful, people, I'll close with this, that we don't get like this in the church. Because there's a lot of that in the church. Don't put your brow up. Well, because yeah, yeah. see, you're no good. You're no good with that mentality to somebody now that just prayed for the blind and the eye opened. Right. They're just going in there, in a sense, not in an arrogant way, in a sense, feel sorry for you for even having that attitude and saying, come on, why don't you just run with me and let's go after this thing? Why all the yeah, buts, well, then how comes, and then that, all the personal hurt, personal agenda, personal grievances, personal questions. We've got to get off of that and not let attitude stop us from where we need to go. It's just a strong, straight word. But I see it a lot in the church. It's that, you know, well, yeah, but... I just preached down the other week. I was, there was a fellow in one of our services, and I said, how things go? Well, I said, was it clear for you? Well... And then he, he had grievances, had issues. And I understand that we have questions, but he had issues. There's a difference between questions and issues. You understand? You can ask a question in humility. And then you would ask a question because in your heart and with attitude, you've already answered it in your own wisdom. So it's not really a question, is it? It's more of a bold stated challenge or something. 
and, and the person was mixing up his question with some stuff. Like, it was just twisted. And, and I, he actually got very convicted because the answer is, it's easy to answer people with the words in your heart. It just is. The word just came out. I could tell he was very convicted and, and, and actually could tell that his, what he was saying wasn't really making sense. But yet he struggled finding the place of humility to just say, wow. You could tell he was trying to hold on to a position that wasn't even relevant. That's just, you, that's human nature. That's pride. So that, you know, you bump into that. You can feel it. You can see it. You can hear it. And it's like, ah, oh, but you keep loving them with the truth because you want that to change. So I'm just saying, every one of us guards your heart from becoming that way. Please. Satan knows how to get people that way. He's done that. He touches you personally. He touches things that touch you personally. You don't see the result you want. And then all these questions rise up. Questions are okay if you ask them in humility. When the question dries up with hurt attached to them, pain, frustration, attitude, it's very hard to hear an answer. I don't know how well they come when you're in that place, even though God's merciful. So it's just a good encouragement to keep your heart in good place. Amen? Amen. Good deal. Uh, any questions? Any thoughts? We just kind of rolled and just started talking. Man. <laughs> John has a little CD thing there we were going to play, but couple things but we just got talking bill shared the testimony and it just kind of went from there any thoughts any questions it's just good let's be encouraged see if we have a good perspective we should always be encouraged because we can always grow we always have the privilege to grow and know him more we always have the privilege to grow and know him more if you're thinking anything else you're not listening to the voice and leading of the holy spirit if there's a mindset that's hindering you stumbling you holding you back frustrating you discouraging you it cannot be inspired from god He's all about edification and increase and growing from glory to glory and faith to faith. So we've got to deal with the mindsets that are trying to draw us and pull us back. True? Because every day I'm privileged to walk through this door of more. (laughs) Yay! And grow up into him and know him more than I've known him before. So enjoy the ride. Enjoy the journey. Don't let the cry of need cause you to scramble and get frustrated and and, 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 you know, there's a, there's a big need. You know, who knows the need's great? Amen. The need's great. That should just put sobriety in us to get before the Lord and, and, and stay in the place of prayer and fasting and wait on the Lord. Because if we wait on the Lord, we'll, revelation will flow. We're not being impressed by the need. We're being moved by love. Do you see what I'm saying? Because a lot of people, the need is so great and, and what we're teaching isn't coming fast enough. So they'll, they're trying other things. They'll try other things. Well, let's try this. Let's try that. Let's try that. And they'll go down all the many roads. And ten years go by and you've filled your head with a whole lot more methods and knowledge. And you haven't really seen any more folks healed. Heaven forbid we do that. Just go stay on the gospel, man. I'm going to follow what Jesus said. We're going to see folks healed all along the way. We're not seeing everybody healed. And I'm not seeing enough healed. We're seeing some healed. We're going to see more if we don't back off. Amen? God. It's the way it is. It's the way it's got to be. Ann just handed me this. I'd ask Ann to come tonight. To Ann's back there. Hi, Ann. This is her little great-grandbaby, right? That's the that, story. Yeah, God, the God little baby that. that was supposed to be born pretty messed up, right? Wasn't she wasn't even supposed to be born, but there she is on the picture because Jesus is Lord. Amen? Amen. The testimony. Amen. I, I'm not going to go into the whole testimony, but That's it was awesome. we prayed. She was a proxy prayer. So the, the mama wasn't even at the service. No, she was six months ago. Anne was at the service. Three months later, we got the package. We got the package. The right. The prophecy came out. We were, we were praying, and I didn't know Anne. And I was just going to pray that, that God would come and unblock this thing. And I was going to command it to be opened and pray like you or I would have prayed. That the thing was blocked, it's pray that it changed. Presently, the prophetic anointing of God came on me. It just welled up, overtook me. God just overtook me. And I started to prophesy. Remember you saw Yeah. I said, yeah, but the Lord, I don't, I don't remember the quote, but it was the gist of it was, 
Am I not the Lord God Almighty? Am I obligated to unblock this thing? He said, as a sign and wonder, I'm not unblocking this thing. I'm just going to hold this child in my hands and secure it in my presence. Like I sustained Moses on the mountain, I'll sustain this child three months in the womb, and I'll leave the thing blocked. That's exactly what happened. I was overwhelmed. I was crying. I said, do you understand what just happened? I was going to pray my great prayer for this thing to open. And God said, we're doing it another way. (laughs) What's that? Right. Right. But God sustained her just like we prayed, just like was spoken. God sustained that baby for three months, which was medically impossible the way they were saying They said if she wasn't dead, she'd have been like a vegetable kind of situation. She's totally 100% normal, not one complication. I called Sarah the day after, and I told her what had happened. And she said, do you know, I just feel very calm. And I just know that God has been spent to me. Amen. God's cool. Isn't that sweet? So there's living proof. That's a good testimony. She came down one night to see you, remember, and tell you, you in. I don't think I've ever met him, did I? Oh, you were out, I was there, John was there. Did I meet her? I don't, I don't think I met him. I'd remember that. I remember she. Oh, yeah. Was... No more questions. Is there anything? We're going to wrap up here. And, you know, I, I know we call this a, like a healing service, but I see it as much as a, like a school teaching, talking, getting things in our minds clear and straight. You know what I mean? We always want to pray for the sick. Of course we do. But we're the body of Christ. I feel like in these meetings we're talking a lot of times to Christians, the body of Christ, to stir in faith, keeping us moving forward, keeping us active in the release of faith, praying for the sick, believing. You know what I mean? Where God's moving. Yeah, pray and always pray. I have my little shirt on today. Push, pray until something happens. That's right. I was wearing that earlier. Were you wearing yours too? You gave me that shirt. Amen. Dave. Your speak. Right to me. I got this leaky heart valve. I'm taking blood pressure medicine. If I take the blood pressure medicine they want, I'd be walking with the cane all the time. It affects my back, my muscles, and everything else. I cut it out today, and I had the best day I had in months. But you made that decision in your own heart to do that. In other words, I'm get I'm setting a... a a pattern seemed to be setting up. Right. When I take the blood pressure medicine, I right. blow up with wind, and then I, I feel lousy. Three right. o'clock, four o'clock, I feel wonderful. This time, I take another pill, and the same old routine. Right. I have nasty dreams sometimes. Right. And but this whole experience is what I'm saying, Dave. This whole thing that you're going through led you to the place where you had the confidence today to back that off and. And walk this out. In other words, that came, that rose up in your own heart to do this. After See, I repair lawnmowers. It's cause and effect. If I have dirt in the carburetor, it won't run. I know I have to take that dirt out. Now, with my situation, it's almost the same thing. There's something isn't right. Now, when do I completely quit taking pills? When do I take blood pressure? When? I, I, I just don't know what to do. I have an idea what I should do. I should forget the blood pressure machine. But on the other hand, I know what can happen if this thing keeps on. My blood top number, my blood pressure goes sky high and I'll have a stroke. But the bottom number is okay. It's, it's low. Now what do I do? When do I say enough is enough and cut everything out? Do I go to the doctor and let him check me out and give me what he thinks he need, I need? Right, well, that's what we're saying tonight. We never, nobody would ever answer that question. That's something you have to know in your heart if you make a certain decision. Like, nobody could ever tell you what to do in the church. They'd be out of order unless it would be some incredible, sovereign, God-manifested thing, but... Yeah, you need to know in your heart from the Lord what's right. In a a sense, I would like to have a word of knowledge. Somebody give me a word of knowledge that I am healed or I should stop the medicine. That's a place to seek God, David, praying. 
and asking him, Lord, I need you to father me in this and give me the confidence of heart to know what I need to do. Because you don't want to get your answer from any suggested thing but your revelation from God. So th- so anything we said tonight, you know, you're saying you're talking to me. In other words, we're, we're talking about your situation. You're in a situation like that. It's, but, it's but, all, what you're talking about is identical right, to the situation. What we're saying is different, different what we're saying is nobody can tell you what to do there. That has to come out of the revelation of your heart. Now, of course, we can surround you, pray, and believe that these complications are overridden by the gospel as far as the outcome, the whole stroke thought. But see, when you're saying, on the other hand, I know that if I don't, that number and there's a stroke, you're actually revealing that you're seeing two sides of this thing. So you're not in the place where we were preaching earlier, like where I did what I did in the parking lot. Because you still see the flip side. There's still a flip side. Do you hear what you had said? Well, see, that's... That's where you need direction. From that's, that's where this is getting... I understand. It's getting every one of us deal with that. Everybody in this room. 70 years of learning gives me trouble. But every one of us deals with that. So this is, this is like... Chuck's honey saying, that's a place for you to get alone and hear from the Lord. You pray. You let him father you. God, 70 years of learning, my mindset, I see a flip side. What are you saying to me right now through the gospel? What are you saying through your love? And you pray and you seek God. That's, that's what you got to do. You'll hear. He loves you. When you ask, it shall be given. But a lot of times I think we're trying to get our answer just through certain teaching, encouragement, what somebody else would do. Situations like this, you're never to do what somebody else would do. You do what you know that you know that what you What he know. does is, for me, one of a kind. You know, what he'll do for me is one of a kind. He'll do something a little different to somebody else. Yes. But for me, it's one of a kind. Yes. In other words, Jesus put mud in a guy's eye. Right. But somebody wants to start a mud ministry. Yeah, right. All of a sudden, you and don't work. a spit tune in a wheelbarrow. <laughs> no, uh-huh. It's not what you do. But here's the deal. Take what you just said and let that be the most intimate, personal thing in your life. In other words, what he does for me is one of a kind. That ought to give you, that persuades you to him because he sees you that way. You're unique and precious in his sight. He loves Dave. Right? right yeah. You see? So that's how you pursue him and you'll know in your heart. And you, you know receive his love. And don't, it sounds like you, you're you under a lot of pressure right now. I'd say the first thing is just like That's good let word. go of the pressure. No, if, you it's have, like a, if you have four months taking this stinking blood pressure medicine see, pressure. and it just, hurts just, that so bad that you need a cane to walk, right. and then all of a sudden, hey, I had enough of this. Right. Now I'm walking all over the place and no problem at all. <laughs> So in light of that, you get along with God, apart from the yep. being pressure-driven, and you say, Father, this is amazing, this decision. But four months, I went through all this. You know how I'm feeling. I thank you right now for your wisdom and direction, and I just trust you right now. And thank you right now for even the revelation, because when you stopped, you had the best day. So it's making you feel like you did the right thing by the result there. So get to God and get answers on the rest of the story, on the rest of what you need to do. Do you see what I mean? Mm-hmm. Where you know in your heart you've heard from the Lord. And where somebody says, well, now, Dave, he's risen by and then you say, listen, man, I've been in prayer and God's spoken to my heart. I just know that. I know. Well, how do you know, Dave? I just know. It's been, <laughs> it's been some time since I had a word like that. Well, Why, you know, I don't know. But it's Seek just, it. Ask it. Ask. Get along with God. <laughs> talk to him. Let him father you, man. Because if we talk about personal relationship in the room, you'd be amazed how many of us don't pursue that intimate place as much as we just pray about what we need. I'm not saying that in a mean way. A lot of us just pray about what we need. We have a prayer list. A shopping list. A prayer list of need. And our prayers consist of what we need God to do to make life smoother and better and da 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 da. And not a lot of people, if they be honest, have an intimate exchange with God where they're letting him father them and receiving his love and, and asking to hear his heart and God, I'm wide open to you right now, and I just love your presence, and I'm asking you to father me today. Right. Not a lot of people do that. They just have a prayer list, and they have needs. They're needs-driven in their pursuit to God Shopping list. rather than love-driven right. to relationship. Right. And I'm telling you, I, I, when I was pastoring full-time, I would ask people all the time what they pray and stuff. Rarely did I have people that said they had could could honestly tell me they had intimacy 
and a face-to-face heart time with God in their daily life. It's very rare to find that. But it's not that they didn't pray. But they prayed for the weather to be right for when they go away with the family tonight and, mm-hmm. and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it was all impersonal. It was just prayers to a God out there somewhere, mm-hmm. hoping that he answered their prayer. And they conviction told him to pray that and believe in God would move. But rarely did he just, Father, I'm just so thankful you love me. God, I'm so excited that you have my best interest in your heart, that you sent your son so I could be your son. Oh, my gosh, you're for me. <laughs> and I'll see. You get flaky in that. You really do. You just draw close to him in that. You see? So uh, you just be real. There's no textbook on that. That's you being you before God and God being who he is to you. Because you're unique. So the pattern, how somebody else prays, like I, I, I would sit in counseling and people would say, I don't pray like that. I say, no, just be you. You're not supposed to say what I say. Mm-hmm. But when you get examples, people say, well, I need to write that down. No, you don't want to go into your prayer chamber or closet or secret place or even in your car and start talking to God and say what I said. It won't mean anything. <laughs> you say what you're saying from your heart. You don't pray what I'm praying. Because what I'm praying means something to me. It's coming out of my own heart. So if you're just parroting what I'm praying, you're not going to have the same response in your spirit that I'm having, right? Right. But we think, well, if I pray what he's praying, I'll have the results. No, it's coming out of the revelation of who we are together. And you want to grow in that. And that's different for everybody. It's just you being you and letting him be God. Amen? Does that make sense? We'll just close with that. So let's, let's pray for one another tonight and and believe God, there's a couple of things, a couple of people surround David. I know we've done that in situations before where we think, you know, well, we've prayed. No, that's we perseverance. We're continuing. We want you to have wisdom. We want you to know that you know. So ask somebody that has faith to believe for this. Ask that God would give him grace to hear and have ears to hear and know what the Spirit of the Lord is saying right now in his life. Who believes God will do that if we ask? He will, won't he? Mm-hmm. Sure he will. We just did that at Harvest Chapel on Sunday. We prayed for an impartation and the grace to come for ears to hear. That we would hear the Spirit of the Lord like no time in our life. That his voice would rise above and, and we would know that it's God. And it was a grace to pray. He put people at every corner and as they were leaving, we were blessing everybody and anointing them and just praying. And some people you'd hear that their minds would get stilled and, and, and the busyness out of their soul and different things. And it was just cool. Amen. Amen. Anybody else need prayer, want prayer, come for prayer?